good morning. Um, my talk today is World Building Out of Bounds. Um, first, uh, just a little bit about my background uh, beyond those things that were just mentioned. Um, so I'm a game designer, writer, and editor, all three. Um, these are some of the games that I've worked on at various indie studios around New York, um, mostly small uh, little teams. Um, and then in 2016, I started my own design and writing consultancy, Paperback Studio. These are some of the projects that I've worked on with that. Um, a lot of my clients are still indies and startups, and I help them with things like world building, story development, narrative mechanics, dialogue. Um, I also teach world building and game design, and I do a lot of community organizing and advocacy. And in all these contexts, my work uh, often deals with community and inclusion and representation, and those are the themes I'm going to be talking about today, too. So a lot of my talks start as a rebuttal to some idea that I've heard floating around out there that I think needs to be debunked. Um, and this one is no different. Um, I've heard this uh, sentiment from some game developers. That's not my story to tell. And this comes up sometimes when there's a question about representation that we're not quite sure how to handle. Maybe we're considering adding a character with a particular marginalized background, or depicting a certain historical period or struggle, or addressing some other sensitive topic where we can't draw on direct lived experience. So not my story to tell isn't just a spontaneous idea. It's an internalized defensive reaction to stave off a criticism that sometimes gets thrown at creators. Stay in your lane. There's a lot of fear in conversations about representation and diversity. Fear of saying the wrong thing, of not being woke enough, putting your foot in it and getting piled on with comments like this. So why risk including a queer character or making your protagonist a person of color or incorporating influences from a foreign culture if it's just going to invite criticism like this if you get something wrong? So a common reaction is just to disengage, decide it's not worth the risk, and stick with what you know. But I think it's really sad when that happens. When we shy away from telling stories about certain kinds of people for fear of giving offense, those identities are rendered invisible in our own work, and when enough of us do this, also in the culture at large. And then the burden of correcting that invisibility falls entirely to the people whose story we've decided that it is. And they're left with a duty to make themselves visible or no one else will do it. So instead, I want us all tackling the challenge of representation and doing it in a responsible and respectful way. So this is a craft-oriented talk today. Um, instead of just explaining why representation is important, um, which I have done a bit in the past, I'm going to skip ahead to sharing tools and strategies that you can actually use, followed by some case studies from my recent work where I've used these tools. So let's get ready to leave our lanes collectively and take our world building out of bounds. So if you want to reflect all the varieties of being that actually exist out there in the world, at some point you'll eventually need to reach outside of your own personal experience. So I'm not really talking to companies and large teams here, but my first rule is applicable to them as well, so let's get the first one out of the way. Build diverse teams. Just staff your project with people who identify with the group or experience that you want to represent. Get those people in the room and give them creative control. Look at the team around you, and if there's a notable lack of diversity of any kind, then first fix that with more inclusive recruiting and hiring. I'm more concerned with addressing indies, solo creators, or small, already existing teams. So this is where the band is already together and you're not hiring, you're not seeking new collaborators. Uh, you're just one person or maybe a small group of people and you don't have that broad range of direct personal experience to draw on, you just have your own. So in that case, what do you do? If you have the means, you should consider bringing on a diversity consultant 
And these are professional paid reviewers who can assess the way marginalized identities and experiences are presented in your work. In the fiction publishing world, this job is known as sensitivity reading, or sometimes diversity reading, or diversity editing, to emphasize the active role that these editorial professionals play in improving your manuscript. And whatever you call it, it's gotten a lot more common in recent years, and it should become standard practice for game development as well. That's what I'd like to see happen. So you can find diversity editors specializing in particular categories of sexual or gender identity, race, national, ethnic, cultural background, uh, lifestyle or family situation, topics like disability, mental illness, addiction, uh, domestic abuse. Um, multiple readers can work on a single project, uh, and each will view and comment on the work through that particular lens that they bring to the work. So if you want to work with a sensitivity reader or a diversity editor, uh, how do you actually go about finding one? One great place to start is uh, at, with an Australian nonprofit called Queerly Represent Me. Um, and I'm indebted to them for laying the groundwork for a lot of the advice I'm sharing here today. They have an excellent resource library and a database of representation in games, and they also offer customized consulting services just for games. You can also poke around some of the same places you would to find a reader for a traditional book. Um, one great resource is the Editors of Color database, uh, where you can browse for professionals who offer sensitivity reading services and filter on a variety of different terms. Uh, you can even find editors who explicitly tag video games as a type of media that they work with. Um, it, it's not that common yet, but I'm hoping it'll grow as more people request this. And even if they don't list it explicitly, I'm betting that a lot of them would find it interesting and be open to working on a game if you reached out and contacted them. But what if you can't afford paid consultants? So first, ask, is that really the case? Maybe you're largely bootstrapping a project, but do you have some budget for external services, like a composer or illustrator, uh, marketing or exhibiting costs? Uh, how about hardware and software? Chances are you're not making something and putting it out there for literally zero dollars. So if depictions of a marginalized group are key to your work, consider allocating even just a few hundred dollars to a session with a diversity consultant. Um, they're easier to work with than ever before, and it could really make the difference between a sterling example of positive representation and an inadvertently um, inaccurate or even offensive portrayal. And if you truly can't pay someone, then do you have friends with the relevant background who would be willing to give you some feedback? It's good to get extra eyeballs on the work, especially at the early stages, even if you are hiring someone later on. And the usual caveats about asking friends for favors do apply here. Um, they might flake. They're likely to be a little less thorough or tactful than a professional might. Um, or they might pull their punches to spare your feelings. And there are the same risks that you get when you use friends and family instead of paid playtesters. So if you've gone that route, you're already kind of familiar with the drawbacks. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're not um, springing this on them without first asking if they're OK with giving this kind of feedback, um, especially if it's something particularly sensitive or confronting. And also make sure that you don't uh, tend to turn towards your same friends as your token whatever friend uh, to give you feedback when you need to save a few bucks on diversity consulting. But the more eyes you can get on the project, the better. So, so far, my advice has all been about what you can do, even as a solo dev, to bring those outside perspectives into your process. But this isn't just about outsourcing the work of representation. So the rest of my tips will be about what you can do on your own. This may be an obvious one, but it's an important one. No matter what you're making, whether you're writing what you know or creating a totally fantastical world, you're going to have to do at least some research, and maybe a lot of it. Um, and here's why you can't get away without it. There's a kind of logical fallacy called generalizing from fictional evidence, and it's something we all do. When you get lost in a good story, it feels like something that actually happened to you. That's the power of storytelling. In the ancestral environment, this worked pretty well. 
If a tribal elder told a story about the foolish hunter who got eaten by a lion, then you might want to treat that as fact. Be just as wary around lions as if you yourself actually saw that hunter get eaten. But our appetite for ever more fanciful fiction has given us this illusion of reliable, feels like firsthand experience of all kinds of outlandish things. So we feel like we would know just what to do in case of a zombie plague, a robot uprising, or a dalliance with a sexy vampire. We have expectations about how these sorts of things go, despite none of them ever having happened. And in the same way, our reliance on fictional evidence gives us the sense of familiarity with places we've never been and people we've never met and cultures we've never experienced. But chances are we've been hearing stories based on stories based on stories, far removed from the original source material and bearing little relation to reality. So a great example of this telephone game in action is the stock medieval setting, particularly this popular idea of a strictly white European Middle Ages. It feels like a familiar historical period, but it's pretty much pure fantasy arising from a chain of popular depictions like this one going a long way back. Medieval scholars know that it was a time marked by a lot of global trade and travel, the modern concept of race didn't exist, and religion more than skin color or national origin was your most salient identity marker. Um, but our stories are dominate, dominated by a simplistic set of tropes and imagery, like images like this, that overlook all of that. So people of color are excluded from stories in the setting, not because they weren't present in the period, but because they aren't present in the stories that we hear about this period. So when a set of tropes becomes too familiar and too constricting, we need to find ways of resetting our imaginations. And resources like this one, the medieval POC Tumblr blog, uh, which collects primary source visual inspiration depicting people of color, uh, is a much needed corrective to that. I also highly recommend an excellent series of blog posts at uh, this site, The Public Medievalist. They have one on race, racism in the Middle Ages, gender, sexism in the Middle Ages, and their current series, which is all about games. So when you're imagining new worlds and stories even loosely inspired by real places and cultures, ask yourself if you have anything other than fictional evidence to go on. Before writing that medieval-esque high fantasy, or an orientalist Arabian Nights fable, or a tale of piracy on the high seas via Disney, via Robert Louis Stevenson, you'd better hit the books first. And that's history books, not story books. Um, but remember that writing history is also another kind of telephone game. And always consider the source, and go for primary sources whenever you can. Um, like this one, for example, um, this is a collection of personal accounts by members of religious minorities, gender and sexual nonconformists, disease sufferers, and other disenfranchised people in their own words that you don't typically hear stories about. So if you're using something like this as your model instead of the latest swords and sorcery ethic, then your work is going to be so far removed from the familiar trappings, it'll be this truly refreshing twist on the genre. Uh, which is something to aim for, I think. So if you're exploring contemporary culture rather than a historical or pseudo-historical setting, you can avoid the telephone game by tuning into work by the actual people whose identities you're writing about. In the world of young adult fiction, this hashtag, hashtag own voices, refers to creators who write about their own marginalized identities. So seek out and read that stuff when you can. Read nonfiction by authors who are embedded in the subject matter and not just reporting clinically from the outside. Also, take time to dig into the critical discourse. Research how the group you're writing about has been represented in fiction in the media and read thoughtful critiques of representation generally. But maybe don't exclusively read critics who look like these guys. <laughs> Here's another uh, great book you can check out. It has essays covering a lot of different perspectives. Um, so what are critics saying about how they see their own identities depicted? <coughs> Who got it right? And what are people getting wrong? What pitfalls can you be forewarned about and just skip altogether? 
So my next tip is to avoid centering narratives of trauma and struggle um, for characters and people with marginal identities that you don't yourself share. Um, even with all of the research in the world and the best of intentions, without a deeper understanding of those issues or someone like a diversity consultant to help step you through them, you run the risk of creating something that is inappropriate or exploitative just for shock value. So instead, uh, focus on positive, empowering depictions of characters who have purpose and narrative agency. You're not obliged to also bring in all of the systems of historical oppression and erasure attached to that identity if you're not personally equipped to make sense of them. If you just give underrepresented figures a central place in your story, that can be powerful and inspiring all on its own. And relatedly, your invented worlds don't need to replicate real world patterns of sexism, racism, other forms of oppression, just to make them gritty or realistic. Uh, and your impressions of how sexism, racism, et cetera, functioned for whatever time and place you're taking as your model were probably inaccurate anyway. Um, see my earlier point about research. Uh, <laughs> metaphors will not save you. That is not a get out of jail free card uh, for dealing with these things. Substituting fantasy races for real world groups in an obvious stand in for, say, the civil rights struggle can really backfire and wind up trivializing real histories of oppression. So if you are working with this kind of material, you should still seek feedback from people who can advise you on sensitively handling these <coughs> themes, even if you are only talking about the disenfranchisement of the forest elves or the closeted lifestyle of vampires. Finally, reconsider the defaults that you tend to fall back on for background characters and bit parts. Even if you already have some diverse heroes taking center stage, make sure your entire cast reflects the diversity that you want to see in your world. For instance, if we have an unconscious white default, which most of us in the Western world or immersed in Western mainstream media do, then we see white characters as the norm and mention skin color only as a special exception. So whiteness becomes the unmarked invisible default and anything else needs to be explained or justified. So there doesn't need to be a reason for a character to have a particular identity. You don't have to work it into the plot somehow. Um, they can just be there and that's great. That's all you need. So I sometimes refer to this technique as re-rolling my characters. I'll keep their personality and their role in the story the same, but I might try on different combinations of gender, or sexual identity, ethnic background, other traits that seem to be underrepresented in the world of the piece. And I mean re-rolling metaphorically, by the way. I'm not advocating literally rolling the die on diversity. I think we can be a little bit more deliberate than that. So that's it for the general rules of thumb. And I want to quickly share a few cases to show how these tools have served me in my own work. So I'm going to stick with recent examples from my work as editor and narrative consultant on Lamplight City, which is a point and click detective adventure released last year by Grindislav Games. So it's set in an alt history 19th century city with steampunk trappings. Um, it's billed as a detective mystery where you can get things wrong, and it takes tonal cues from Poe and Dickens. So Poe for mystery and the macabre, and Dickens for class struggle and social unrest. It has a pretty broad palette of representation, and it deals with some heavy themes of discrimination and marginalization of various groups. Women, the poor, people with mental illness, queer people, people of color. Um, these are sensitive subjects, and we took a lot of care to handle them carefully and do them justice. So as a consultant coming onto the project, one aspect of the story that I could immediately address um, was the representation of women and the gender politics of this world. So one of the first things that I look for is to see if women constitute at least half of the characters, and especially the main characters who have agency. And in this case, the player character, um, Detective Miles Fordham, was male. And of the three major non-player characters, only one, Miles' wife, Adelaide, was a woman. So I brought out that character re-roll that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, I can't quite see my 
Can I get the notes scrolled down a little bit, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the first suggestions that I made was to change the character of Edward Upton, who is the main support character who slips the player's cases and provides guidance and advice throughout the game into a woman. So the result is what I consider the game's best character, uh, the police desk officer Constance Connie Upton. Um, and I also insisted that none of the other character details that we'd already established should change. So she remained an overweight, desk-bound officer with marital troubles, a brave and loyal friend with an impish sense of humor, and this easy, teasing rapport with her old buddy Miles, who habitually greeted her as up to no good. So I love their easygoing, steadfast, collegial friendship, and I really believe that the dynamic might have been subtly different if the character had been conceived as a woman from the start. So as originally planned, Connie and Miles still had uh, clandestine meetings in a coffee shop, um, although we had established that these uh, places were off limits to women as they were in the real world during the time. So we wanted to keep that detail in, and we added a line about how Connie had used her official position to strong arm the proprietor into turning a blind eye. So this helped us establish that there were these attitudes of gender discrimination in the world, but also showed Connie as an assertive risk taker who wasn't afraid of bending the rules when she needed to. We also further developed Connie's backstory. So originally, Edward Upton was to have suspected his wife of cheating, with the idea that the player could help uncover this uh, mystery in the story. Um, but after the gender swap, we changed it so that Miles and Connie had become friends originally when he helped her get the proof that she needed of her husband's infidelity in order to legally secure a divorce. Um, so this conveyed, again, how the lopsided laws of this society oppress women, but how someone resourceful and determined would need to navigate them to survive. So that's one way that I used the character reroll in Lamplight City. It deepened the world building, and it gave us a really interesting character in what might have otherwise been a somewhat rote role. So I rerolled the gender of one other minor character in the game, in this case changing the secretary in the law office from a woman into a man. So that didn't do any favors for the overall total gender balance of the cast, but it did reduce the proportion of women in the game who were serving in these secretarial or service roles. So if you're finding that your representatives of marginalized groups are mainly cropping up in these kinds of subordinate roles, then especially ones that don't have narrative agency, that don't have a character arc, then it's not a bad idea to shift things around and maybe just you know stick the white guy behind a desk every once in a while. <laughs> so we also consulted with friends about certain aspects of the story that we wanted to get right. One issue was the depiction of race and racism, which plays a large role in the story. So Miles, a white man, is in a mixed marriage with his wife, Addie, a black hairdresser who is a former lounge singer. And we see some of the ways that they face discrimination. And in the very first case, you're tasked with aiding a man who's apparently been falsely accused on account of his race and isn't receiving fair treatment from the justice system. So these themes are present, but race was originally even more prominent until we got some feedback from testers that made us rethink that a little. So we established that slavery had been abolished only fairly recently in the history of this world as opposed to the real world. And one of the early cases originally revolved around a grand dame, one of the city's elites, who was known for offering paid employment to her former slaves, which was regarded as an especially compassionate and merciful thing to do by her peers, but it was a cover for these acts of abuse. And we got feedback uh, from some of our uh, testers saying that these heavy themes of slavery and racism were distracting and disturbing, and that they weren't narratively justified. There wasn't a good reason for these topics to be in there. So we listened, and we changed the focus of the case. Um, we removed the uh, references to slavery, and instead, um, the thing that was special about this household was that uh, the Grand Dame employed uh, actual employees when everyone else was replacing their workers with uh, automated machines. Um, 
and that that kept the story much more in line with some of the game's larger themes like class struggle, anxieties about increasing mechanization and automation. Um, and more important, we avoided including, including this polarizing and confronting detail that really truly served little purpose other than shock value in the story. So the final bit I'd like to talk about is how we sought consultation about specific scenes of racial discrimination. Um, so the player, as Miles, witnesses some racist comments and attitudes directed towards his wife. And originally, the player would be offered a few options to respond, either to defend Addie or to let it pass unchallenged, and there would be consequences for the relationship later on. So if you failed to speak up, then Addie would feel betrayed and later reproach you for your silence. But when we discussed these scenes with friends who were members of mixed couples, they pointed out that it didn't feel right. It would uh, be more typical for the more privileged person in the relationship to feel insulted and outraged and want to say something. Um, whereas the less privileged, privileged, more marginalized person would tend more to downplay or defuse the situation. Uh, that they would be more accustomed to just letting things like that pass as a matter of daily survival. So uh, we listen to that, and in the final version, while the player still gets to choose which indignant thing to say, Miles will always say something. And when he tries to commiserate with Addie by complaining that she shouldn't have to hear things like that, then she's the one who shrugs it off. She's heard worse. If she had stopped putting up with all of the casually racist ladies whose hair she styles, she says, then she wouldn't have any clients at all. And you have no say at all in how this scene plays out. So when a police officer, whom you're trying to distract from something he's guarding in classic adventure game fashion, uh, he directs racist insults toward Addie, and Miles just decks him. There's no slow playing this one. So if you just gone ahead with those scenes as we... <laughs> Yes, you get the satisfying result. Uh, I didn't want to leave you in suspense. Um, if we just originally uh, kept those scenes as we had written them, based only on our intuition, uh, then we'd have gotten something wrong that felt wrong to people who had more experience with that sort of thing. Um, but because we sought out their input, then we wrote something that felt much more real. So we covered a lot of ground, and I am rapidly running out of time. So before we close, I'll quickly recap the takeaways. So if you're hiring or building a team, diversity should be a priority. Hire sensitivity readers, diversity editors, other consultants, whatever they, they're called, especially if you're writing sensitive material, budget for it. Whether or not you have paid consultants, um, seek feedback from friends who have the relevant uh, background and experience. Beware fictional evidence. Always do your research, whether or not you're using a familiar genre setting or a fictional world. Read contemporary accounts and consume works by marginalized creators in their own voices. Get current with these conversations about representation and diversity, like follow the critical discourse and really uh, listen to what people are saying. Don't uh, lean on uh, the tales of real trauma and oppression as just story fodder or a crutch to add punch and excitement to your narrative. Uh, show people um, in empowered roles. Give them agency and a visible place in your story. <coughs> and beware that use of metaphors as a crutch, uh, using those stand-ins for historically oppressed groups. And reject the normative re defaults and re-roll your characters to get the diversity that you're going for. Moment for pictures. So, support marginalized voices telling their own stories, and pull up a chair and tell your story too. That is it. Thank you.